Hello, everyone, and welcome to Popcorn for Breakfast. We've got an exclusive sneak peek of one of the newest movies out in theaters now, Arthur the King. Let's chat. This is Popcorn for Breakfast, presented by St. Louis Area Smoothie Kings. Now, here are your hosts, Cam and Kirk. Well, 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 hello everyone. We are freshly out of the movie theater. That's right, our bellies are still full of popcorn and soda. Oh, it hurts. It's just rolling it, around it in hurts. there. Something about, I love movie theater popcorn, as I know most people do, but man, it just really, it just really sits, yeah. doesn't it? It's I ate the first half of that popcorn bag same. in probably less than four minutes. Yeah, and then I was like, no, no more. <laughs> that was bad choice. Delicious, but just bad, bad, all yeah. bad. We visited a, a newer theater that we've only been to a couple of times. I haven't been there in quite some time. Cam got to go see Kung Fu Panda 4 there. Yes. Um, so the po- he, he gave me the heads up. The popcorn was exquisite. I said the popcorn... Is slapping. He said slapping. I said it's 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 slapping. It was. It was. It was. It truly was. So, but at what cost, Kirk? (laughs) At the cost of our of of our stomach lining. Oh my gosh! It's. I feel like it's peeling off right now, and I'm gonna throw it all up. Well, if you're still listening today, we're gonna chat about Arthur the King, the newest Mark Wahlberg film in theaters. That's right. It drops this weekend. Coming up in the future, we got an early press screening this. Week I love that you said exclusive, yeah. which is not true, but I, I like that you said it. <laughs> like, like I like that just like spicing it up. A yeah, little bit. Just I, like exclusive <laughs> just makes people go, makes people go, hmm, and then only to find out that it's not. But it was, it is an early screening, and this review will be out before the movie comes out. So, yeah, I think exclusive should be on all the copy for this Agreed. episode. Uh, it should be in the exclusive th- <laughs> in the thumbnail. Yeah, everywhere. I love it everywhere and i'm gonna get a t-shirt made maybe not the thumbnail i don't know will youtube i don't know we'll find out we'll find out (laughs) some things you can only learn the hard way (laughs) oh man giddy from the popcorn and it's late so let's get into this cam you have the honor of going first tonight yes you're gonna get to tell us and have the probably the best picks of this let's go for and the oscar goes to who's gonna get the best performance of this film what a pleasant surprise this is oh wait Um, i forgot to say what this movie is about you can if you want to. I'll say it real quick. Or I can, since you were. We can. Go ahead. I'm going to say one word. I'll fill in the gaps. Then no, you say no. the next word. Not, not the three-headed opera singer. Just go. <laughs> just go. This is a, based on a true story. There's something in our culture called adventure racing, which I was not privy to. Same. It's basically like um, uh, The Amazing Race, the it's TV like show. It's like racing, but metal. Yes, but adventure <laughs> <laughs> So uh, you you basically you have a four man team, uh, four man four woman team combination, whatever, and you go to an isolated place and you just have to you have a set of rules. You have to hike, you have to climb, you have to row, you have, you have to, to run. get through like a, what was it like eleven gates or something like that. You have to yes. hit eleven checkpoints, but how you get to each checkpoint is is your choice. It's flexible. Yeah, yeah. There's there's limited rules on that part of it. You it's just, pretty cool. You just it's, can't drive. Like no, no. It's pretty cool. It seems extremely difficult. Yes. Like not something I would ever even, it wouldn't even cross my mind ever in, in a thousand million years. I signed I, us up for oh, next no, year's race. Oh no, no. <laughs> <laughs> but all that said is, it's based on an, the incredible true story of this team while they were on this race in 2018. Uh, this dog suddenly appeared and started following them on their race and just kept following them, and they, he became a part of their team. And the incredible story about how the dog motivated them and the the, the ups and downs through the through the race course as as they went it's a five-day race and uh there's like hundreds of competitors it's insane it's crazy it's insane so all that said now cam tell us who acted the best in this movie you know kirk i have to go with old tried and true marky mark (laughs) marky mark and the funky bunch mark Wahlberg, Wahlbergers fame um he's done so many amazing things the departed the fighter uh, not Uncharted. That was not good. No. Um, Lone Survivor. He's he's in an interesting place in his career where he kind of does movies like this, which are like based on a true story, um, sort of engineered for crowd pleasing. Uh, you know, meant to be meant to be 
mass appeal, crowd pleasing type movies. That's what he's been mm-hmm. kind of shifting toward. This movie definitely falls in that category. But you know what the thing is, I I fall into this trap, and maybe it's just because I'm, I'm a cynic these days, where I see one of these type of Mark Wahlberg movies come across the ticker, and I go, ugh, not one of these. But <laughs> he's still got it, man. He he has the glue for this type of movie that just makes it like, it makes it, it makes it entertaining at the end of the day. It's an entertainment product and he makes it entertaining and he, he helps fit the cast together. He helps make everything work. He is much like his, his role that he's playing. He is the captain of the team here. And I remember seeing lone survivor in theaters and thinking this is going to be cheesy and dumb and, It was to an extent, but he made it so compelling. And I feel like that's very much um, what his role was in this movie, was to make it compelling and and to help tell this story, which anytime you get a based on a true story movie, it's usually because the story's pretty darn good. You know, Mm -hmm. otherwise they would make a movie about something else. But instead uh, they made a story about this and Mark Wahlberg just has, I mean, it's it's, it's totally intangible. He just has the the it factor for these types of movies. And I think he's making a boatload of money doing it. So good for him. And uh, yeah, so he gets my, he gets my Oscar goes to, is it, is it perfect? No. Is the dialogue cheesy at times? Absolutely. And does he stumble through a few lines? Sure. But he's him and he's got that (laughs) magnetism to him and it just, it all just works because he's here. Yeah. He's incredible. He really is. Um, I, I look forward to a kind of, not return to form because I don't think we'll ever get that again. But I want to see the the new a newer version, even from this, of Mark Wahlberg, where we can really uh, just see what's going on in his head uh, because there's so many things turning, and I just need someone to focus him. Where we could see like a best supporting actor uh, nomination in the, in the future, that would be really cool. He's you know he's a total pro and total business, mm-hmm. and I think he's he's probably learned that he can make a boatload of money doing these, and they're not as much effort and they're higher paying than if you're if you're you know cast member number 10 on the call list yep. in a Mar- in a Martin Scorsese movie or you know uh, a, a David O Russell movie or something like that. Yeah. Um and and that's all fine and well. I heard him on a podcast somewhat recently kind of talking about it and he just is very business like in his approach. Like he's got his team and they're reading through scripts and they're figuring out what works. And I think he's been remarkably successful as a business person and as a, as a professional in this industry. So you have to tip your cap to him. Uh, It would be great to see him do some of those more, um, you know, those more intense roles where he gets to explore a character more than just kind of playing himself. Cause in these movies, he always kind of plays some version of himself. Mm -hmm. Um, But you know, this is what we've got right now. Yeah, I will say that a couple of upcoming roles of his are, are pretty exciting. I, f- I forgot he's going to be the six billion dollar man. Oh right, they've upped the money. Yeah. It used to be million, now it's billion, six billion dollar like man. That. I like that. <laughs> More expensive when you put Mark Wahlberg back together. Um, <laughs> a movie called Play Dirty, Flight Risk, The Union. Flight Risk is going to be a, a Mel Gibson directed film, but he's going to be playing an air marshal, a U.S. air marshal, um, who somehow has to get a fugitive across state lines, uh, trying to get. They've crashed somehow, or the, I don't know what happens, but that, that looks, sounds about right. It looks good. It looks right <laughs> up his alley. Right? It does. It does. So that's exciting. We'll, we'll see what happens with, with these upcoming roles. Great pick, great choice. My Oscar tonight goes to Simu. How do you say his last name? Liu. Simu Liu. Yes, mm-hmm. Mr. Shang-Chi himself. You've seen him in, uh, a long time ago in the, the, the Disney uh, MCU franchise uh, 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 introduction, and he's back here. We've also seen him in Barbie, who is fun and exciting. And Barbie, you saw him at the Oscars. He got to perform I'm Just Ken with Ryan Gosling. He was uh, a stage scene stealer there as well. But I loved this this role for him. The the person that he's portraying is like an influencer. They're full of themselves. They're, they're very um, in tune with their aesthetics of who they are and how they look at all times. Uh, what I loved about this role, though, is that he wasn't 
obsessed. He was just very attentive to it all. Like it never got to um, tip the the scales where it was annoying or trying too hard. It was like Simu just really loved to continue to create content the entire time they were on this race and the conflicts that go with that against people who couldn't care less about that. Uh, so I really I really appreciated that w- with his role. He's got just a, a magnetic smile, a magnetic personality in whatever character he plays. And unlike Shang-Chi where they tried to give him sometimes comedic moments with Aquafina. In this, he got to play full on. He was the humor of this movie. Uh, he he was uh, taking on all, most of the jokes here and that played very well for me. So, Simu, you get the win for me. Yeah, he's got comedic chops. I think it's great casting mm-hmm. here um, because this is <laughs> this is if you follow Simu Liu on any sort of social media, you you could see him as this type of person. Yeah. You know, just like somebody who's very in the loop on social media and having conversations with people, engaging with his followers on a regular basis. I mean, he's replied to our tweets before, actually, um, too, like that we've tweeted at him. Thanks, Simu. So shout out Simu Liu. <laughs> um, I wanted to hate him in this movie because because <laughs> in the trailer, there are some really rough line reads. Um, there's one where he says, like what's up, Paw Patrol? You were actually in the oh, bathroom whenever he yeah. said that uh, this time, oof. and it's like that's like one of the only things you see in the trailer and a couple others, and it's like oof, ouch. But I have to hand it to him; he he ended up playing the role exactly as it was described, and just like checking all the boxes. So as much as I wanted to hate it, and yes, the dialogue's rough at times, and yes, there's some some clunky line reads. In my opinion. He nailed it. He sells it. Like any influencer. Yeah, he exactly. Sells it. He sold it. He sold it. <laughs> well, next up, let's talk about our scene stealers. It, besides the person who was leading the pack and who was not Mark or Simu, who is the next in line to get some flowers tonight? Yeah, um, I have to go with Natalie Emanuel, mm-hmm. um, who I just keep waiting for her to have that role that sends her to the next level. I feel like, man, she's right there. Like, she's appeared in um, the Fast and the Furious franchise. And I think in that movie, uh, F9, that we reviewed on the podcast, uh, that Fast and the Furious movie, she was in that film. And she was, in my opinion, the best actor in the whole thing. Like, she actually went for it. She was kind of wow. like the, the the more techie yeah. person in the I think you crew. probably gave her an award. I think on I that did. I think too. I did. Yeah. And she, of course, played Miss Ande, or I always say her name wrong, Miss Ande in uh, Game of Thrones, which is her claim to fame, her biggest role that she's had. And she's had a few sprinkled in here and there. Um, I didn't see fast X, but I assume she's in that movie as (laughs) well. Um, And so, yeah, she's been in a few and I think she's really got a ton of talent and I feel like she gets to, when she is cast well, she just shines so, so well. And I didn't think this was any, any different for her. I thought that she was perfectly cast in this film. I thought that she has a level of intensity that she brings whenever she performs that I think it's just sometimes it can feel a little out of place if she's miscast, but when she's cast correctly, it just feels so perfect and it just lends a level of credibility and authenticity to the story and the film and helps you get engaged. And I really felt like that was the case here where um, her character has got an interesting storyline and an interesting background. She's one of the truly um, she's, she's, different from the other characters on this team. She's one who like sets themselves apart among this cast. And I thought she excelled here. Um, Again, same caveat. Are there moments where there's clunky lines that she has to read? Yes, but that's more on the dialogue. And I think she's working really hard. And I think more often than not, it, uh, it really pays off. So I have to give her some props. Natalie Emmanuel, we're, it's coming. Your day, your day in the light is coming. She's had some great roles. She's had a great career so far. She's still very young, and I know that a big breakthrough is coming for her. You know what it's going to be in Francis Ford Coppola. Oh, Megalopolis. Megalopolis. I saw her on that cast list, and I was like, "Let's go." I so, think that's going to be it. I really. She's think... pretty high up in the billing too. I think, if I remember correctly. Like, yeah. I don't think she's like way down the list on Megalopolis coming straight out of Francis Ford (laughs) Coppola's pocket. (laughs) Yeah. I thought she was on like the weird title treatment poster thing that he (laughs) posted. Uh, So I'm, yeah, I'm, 
I'm excited for her. She deserves Excellent. it. Excellent. Well, I have been searching for the name of my scene stealer, but I can't seem to find the real name. This is pretty rude. It's not in the cast list on IMDb. What? I'm going with the dog who plays Arthur. Oh, yeah, Cameron. of course. <laughs> Good. Because this dog, man, when I tell you I have a one-year-old, one and a almost two-year-old puppy with me. Um, she's a black lab, uh, border collie mix, and she is smart. I'll give her that. But man, she will not stop being a puppy at times and just does some really dumb things like runs into doorways. Um, does it like she's walking in front of you, stops and makes you trip over her. Um, but I did you find the name? I found the name, Kirk. What's the name? Yukai. Yukai. U-K-I or sorry, U-K-A-I. So hopefully that's right. U-K, Yukai. Yukai. I like yeah. it. I like it. Yeah, absolutely. Just a, a, just an absolute baller. This dog. Um, uh, I believed every moment uh, of, of his acting because sometimes you get some dogs in dog movies that are just like, all right, that's fine. <laughs> They're yeah, they like there. they edit it weirdly together, and it feels like maybe this dog wasn't cooperating. Yeah, <laughs> but not here. You always see the back of the dog running. <laughs> you never yeah. see its face. You're like, is that the same dog? Or like in a call of the call, yeah, a call of the what is that movie? Call of the Wild. The Call of the Wild. The Call of the Wild, where it's a completely CGI dog with Harrison Ford. <laughs> or like the Shaggy Dog, where, the it's, shaggy. where it's a guy in a in a sheepdog outfit. <laughs> That's my personal favorite. That one's incredible. Um, so I, I really think this dog just was next level. I I've not seen any dog endure what it had to endure with uh, with a film set and crew and all the demands that had to go with it adorable very cute absolutely adorable and heart-wrenching at times because it's a dog movie so there's going to be some painful um owner moments in there yeah very cute in like a in like a homely kind of dog Mm -hmm. way you know like a like a dog next door what i loved too yeah (laughs) homely is a great a great word to express it as because (laughs) because there, a lot of dog movies, like the dog is perfect. The dog perfect. is always groomed. Yes. This dog is in the jungle on a five day race for its life, hoping that these people will adopt it at the end of this race. Yeah. And the whole time he's like real scraggly and like, you're like, yeah, that's a jungle dog. Yes. That's a dog you would find in the Dominican Republic. Just jungle on the dog. street. That's what I'm going <laughs> that's for. The that's Halloween. <laughs> Arthur the King too. <laughs> jungle dog. Return to the jungle. <laughs> so yeah. Uh, Yukai is my answer. I love it. And it bears repeating. Uh, for when we just had the Academy Awards, and I'm going to say it again. I'm going to say it louder for for the um, Board of Governors of the Academy of, <laughs> of Motion Pictures. Best animal performance. Yes. What What are we waiting for exactly? I mean, we saw Messi the dog from Anatomy of a Fall. That's an easy Oscar win right there. Yes. Come on, let's let's just go. I we also need... loved the moment where they had fake dog paws yeah. <laughs> and made Messi clap. <laughs> that was classic. That's just pure. That's gold. It right was there. it was so brief, and I'm like, oh my gosh, that person is brilliant. Whoever Genius. decided that. Genius. Yeah, I think that would be wonderful. You know, the, this year's Oscars uh, just as a quick nugget. I don't think that they were like out of this world fantastic, but they were a little bit more entertaining than mm-hmm. years past. And you added a dog category. Come on. Come on. Add an animal category. How fun would it be to see, you know, the Academy Awards, everybody's coming up in tuxedos and these beautiful ball gowns, Mm -hmm. and then one category smack in the middle, like a horse walks on stage. Oh, my goodness. Or like a bird. You know, it'd be hilarious. It'd be great. A a bear. A real bear. Well, you remember the the bear. um, there, There was a bear movie that I watched that was like, there was this one bear back in the day. I can't remember what it was called. The Revenant. No, there was this bear back in the day who was like a huge bear actor and was in like oh. every bear movie. I can't remember his name. I did a whole thing on him. Uh, bear in the Big Blue House. No. Uh. The movie was called just like, I don't know. I'm not going on this tangent right now. I'm just saying there was a bear actor back in the day who yeah. like definitely deserved an Oscar. That's fantastic. Yeah. I'm going to go into your psyche His name was later. like Kodiak Joe or something like that. It was, I don't know. It was something. It was something. We're going to figure this out and let you know later, guys. <laughs> uh, next up, we're going to chat about the showstopper. The moment in the movie, whether it was production value, theming, mm-hmm. uh, whatever it may be, we got lots of options for this that really stuck out to you and said, this is the glue to this movie. What you got, Kim? I think the glue and, and like the, the production value thing with this movie is just understanding its audience. I think this movie understands that this is not an art house film. It's just meant to entertain people. It's just meant to tell a story. Mm -hmm. And later on, that'll be part of the reason that I knock this movie. But, you know, in terms of like, 
this movie was made for a purpose, it achieved that purpose, which is to give people uh, heartwarming, crowd pleasing, sometimes agonizing, sometimes, you know, emotional film about, I mean, how many of these dog movies have we seen over the years? Marley and me. And, Too many. And the art of driving in the rain or whatever that one was called Ugh. with Milo. Um, there's been a ton. Kev, the Kevin Costner one that was like dog's purpose or something like yeah. that. Um, there's been a zillion of them and they're not going to win the Academy Awards. They're always a bit cheesy. They're always a bit clunky. But this one was like, we're out here to make an entertaining movie. It didn't didn't try to shy away from that. It wasn't like it leaned head on into that. And it's like, this is what we're doing. And it did it. So I always look for a movie that has a clarity of vision <laughs> for better or worse. This one does it. Mm-hmm. It said, this is the type of movie we're trying to make and they made it. Yep. So do I, do I like that? Would I prefer that it be a bit more artistically inspired? Sure. But at the end of the day, they were trying to tell a story. They were trying to tell it in an entertaining fashion and they did. So have to give them credit for that. Beautiful. I'm going to go with a specific scene. Okay, so remember, they're on an adventure race, right? So they have to climb, they have to crawl, they have to swim, they have to do all these sorts of things. Well, they encounter a zip line. I'll tell you that right now. And it's one of the most exhilarating scenes I've seen in a long time in a movie. Uh, I thought when they got to it, it'd be kind of gimmicky. Like, oh, it's a zip line. Okay, someone's going to fall and break a leg, you know? And maybe they do, because this is a spoiler-free spoiler free. review. But what they do with this scene... Um, I'm assuming that it comes straight from the book because this is based on a book on the real events, uh, the the person that this happened to, which is Mark Wahlberg's character. Michael Lindner, Lindner. And his team. And I believe that this was so incredibly well executed that you know when you're watching a movie and things become almost episodic like okay we've got to get to obstacle one we've we've met our team here's up here's the big the first big obstacle they overcome it they get to the next one here's the next big obstacle that movie didn't feel like this and it was a race it very well should have felt like that but this first big obstacle uh just was exhilarating and you were just rooting for the team to succeed uh and i was literally on the edge of my seat i was very excited about this moment love it moving on it's time to rip this movie apart. Are you ready, Cam? I am ready. <laughs> Put on your director's shoes and tell us what went wrong. I think for me, it's the it's the blatant embellishment that's happening in this movie. And I'm saying, you know, I'm saying this from from a position of ignorance, having not read the book or familiarized myself with the original story. Or you've not been on the adventure. I've race. not been on the adventure race mm-hmm. yet. Apparently, we will be soon. <laughs> um, but the writers of this film are Michael Brandt, who is a seasoned uh, screenwriter, wrote 310 to Yuma, a few other films. Um, and then Michael Lindner, who was the actual person that this story is about and also the writer of the book that is based on his true life that mm-hmm. this movie is based off of. But there are things that happen in this movie that are just clearly Hollywood, um, things that did not happen the way that they're happening. It's, you know, it's when you can tell that something is a version of the truth, but in no way um happened that way that can that can kill it you know with it with particularly with a based on true story movie i think a lot of times people think oh well people expect it to be a little bit hollywoodified if it's a based on true story movie and i think that's true to an extent but if you go if you do it on things that you don't have engagement because you're like eh, that didn't really happen that way because you can just tell uh because you have lived on earth and you know how real life works mm-hmm. like this is a remarkable story that by its own merit um you know based on what i've read in the plot synopses and things like that going into the movie it's just a really cool story so whenever they go to the extent of embellishing certain things the the dialogue particularly the way that certain scenes play out, adding the drama to it. Sure. You have to do that to an extent, but this movie at times goes too far. And I think that for me, it makes me go, well, what's the real story? You know, Mm -hmm. like what, what actually happened here? That's what I'm more interested in. And if you hadn't gone so far with the dramatic writing, or if you hadn't gone so far with, with um, how you decided to go about the, the adaptation of this scene for the film, Maybe I'd be more engaged, but at times it's just too much for me. 
Yeah, it no longer suspends your disbelief. No. It just takes you out of it for sure. For sure. Yeah, I could see those moments in here. Um, for me, my director's shoes, it's tough. Uh, a lot of it comes down to some weird character development moments that are very forced. Um, there's a really early early on in this film, uh, when the race begins, one of the characters just blurts out uh uh, a characteristic uh, that's supposed to propel their character forward <laughs> and motivate the team. It was so malplaced and eye rolling that yes. I was, I almost said, all right, let's go home cam. Yeah. <laughs> Cause I really thought like, are we going to get this dialogue for the rest of the film? Thank goodness. We didn't get that level of <laughs> the rest of it. Um, and I would say that there is a level of uh, distrust to, to the audience, that, that that there were also, again, moments where they're trying to develop these characters together where <laughs> it's almost like a therapy session. All right, one character sits down, the other uh, the other team member talks to them, they get up, the next one walks in. They chat, they leave, the next one comes in like a revolving door. And I thought that was a really strange thing to do in such limited time and such a creative space. You have all of the outdoors, so why not get a little bit more, uh, more fun with the camera? So I thought that... The those moments were just really boring uh, f- and and not uh, not interesting as the viewer in the audience. Yeah, and just like unnecessary at times, right? Yeah. Like like to your point on distrust of the audience, it's like we're being handheld through everything, and this is not a complex story. No, like there's there's room for subtext where nobody's going to get lost. Mm-mm. You know, <laughs> like yeah. we don't have to have every single thing that's happening, even the stuff that's happening in the background. We don't have to have it explained. We can connect the dots in our brains that we have. Yeah. Um, but you know, that's kind of to what I was alluding to before is like they engineered. I say, I keep using the word engineered for this movie <laughs> because it feels like it just came off a conveyor belt. Like they were like, I mean this, no joke. This movie is exactly 90 minutes long, which is hilarious. Uh, like exactly. That is the runtime. And it, you know, it's, it, it really feels like somebody at the Lionsgate <laughs> studios headquarters had a spreadsheet and they're like, Based on our data and our CRM, <laughs> we feel that if we create a movie around this story starring Mark Wahlberg, Simu Liu, we've, they've got little index scores next to them, we will generate this much revenue. That's really what this movie feels and like. Don't forget that guy from CSI <laughs> back in the early 2000s. Yes. <laughs> but it's like, at times it would be nice if this movie didn't feel that way. You yeah. know, if it had a little bit more realness and a little bit more heart that was not like 3D printed, but like actual real heart and emotion and realness um, because to your point, it just kind of throws the whole thing. It, it, keep, it gets you, keeps you out of getting to that point where you're like, Oh man, this is so touching. Mm-hmm. You know? All right. No more trash talk. Yep. It's time for final thoughts and score on Arthur the King. Yeah. I, I think this movie is about what I was expecting and I, and sure I, I shouldn't base expectations off trailers and things like that. I, I really do try to keep a clear mind with these things, but Cameron wore a dog shirt. Uh, no, I just mean like... And a Mark Wahlberg puppet. He was so excited for this movie. How many of these dog movies have we seen? The formula is there. This movie doesn't deviate much from it. It doesn't deviate much from the biopic like formula either. It's just... It is... It, I mean, it take it at face value. It is what it is. Mm-hmm. And I think that it does what it set out to do. Like I said earlier, I think a lot of people who are the target audience for this type of film are going to go to the theater. They're going to watch it. They're going to leave pleased with the results because that's what they were wanting. They were wanting. It's, it's kind of like people who t- tune in every week to NCIS mm-hmm. or CSI CSI network TV shows. They go, I want this kind of thing and they get it. And they're like, great box check. That was good enough for me. Um, and that's what this kind of movie represents too. And so I think it's that, so I give it some credit for doing what it set out to do, but as an artistic endeavor, it doesn't bring a ton to the table. It's just a retelling of a story with a little bit too much embellishment at times, but overall, um, I, I assume it's pretty faithful to the story based on what I've looked into, which is brief, albeit. Um, so I can't go super high because I think its artistic merit is pretty low and it's purely a commercial product and purely something that they're just trying to like target a specific group and get them to buy tickets job well done, but I can't go above a four, six 
four six four point six out of ten kernels. All right, all right. Um, I, I really hate the phrase "it is what it is," but that's yeah, what I do too. <laughs> but I say it all the time. <laughs> I hate that phrase. I hate uh, leaves much to be desired. Those are like, if you say those on a regular basis, I'll let you like slide it's by and, and say them. <laughs> Kirk, <laughs> Kirk hates me. <laughs> I, it's, I am that guy. <laughs> and I hate myself. So. I bring these things up so that way you don't say them anymore. <laughs> you listen to the edits and you're like, Point oh my gosh. <laughs> no, no, no. The, there's, there's those kind of phrases. It is what it is. Uh, that's, I, I hate doing it, but that is what this movie is literally is like here's the story here is some hollywood money here is a hollywood star and a couple of up up and comers and a couple of unknowns and let's put it together with a really cute and really smart dog uh i i really thought that i was in dog movies i never actually get attached to the dog i will say that Mm. first and Mm -hmm. foremost i'm usually like okay it's a dog and I know it's going to be safe, even if they quote unquote kill the dog in the movie. The dog is safe; they don't kill the move, <laughs> kill the actual dog actor. Um, so all of, all of that said, this dog had me emotional for the first time in my life. Uh, there were scenes that they put this dog in that uh, is is very relatable if you own your own dog and the, and the 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 scary things that happen with a with a dog uh, and its life. And this was the first time I really felt something for a dog movie. Um, so I found I was happily surprised by that in fact it 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 lingered on so long the couple of scenes i was like oh my gosh can they move on (laughs) i don't want to live in my past trauma anymore uh so i I really appreciated that i thought those scenes were well done and ultimately though there is uh, it comes down to what what we've spoken about earlier and one of the worst cgi shots i've ever seen in a film oh dude there is one (laughs) yes that cameron and i Cameron and I started laughing openly. I was so thankful I had no food or drink in my mouth, or I would not be sitting here right now. I would have been, I would be deceased. I barely survived it as is. It would have been all over the the back of the head in front of us. They almost need a warning on the screen, like <laughs> countdown, ten seconds to terrible CGI shot that will jar you to your core. Oh my gosh, it was insane. It was so out of place. <laughs> For the rest of the film, it made no sense. And hopefully they'll, you know how Hollywood <laughs> likes to go back and edit their movies now? Please do. <laughs> like, I'm, a, I'm fully against that. I just hope somebody gets a high-res <laughs> clip of it so we can use that meme forever. Yes, yeah, someone please pirate that <laughs> please. part of the movie. We'll tell you about when it happens so when, when our listeners go and see it. Um, I, I do believe that because I, I was for the very first time ever attached emotionally to this dog that my score is higher than you cam love it and i'm shocked i'm shaken and i don't know how i feel because we also missed the first like five minutes of this film don't say that because of traffic i have to say it's not true it's not true it's totally true we're being honest here okay but all that said nothing happened in that five minutes my score for arthur well i think we missed bear grills i my score for arthur the king is 5.9 5.9 curls. Okay, okay. I was like, if he goes into the sixes, we might have to have a conversation. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just, I'm just, just kidding. <laughs> You're welcome to do whatever score you want. Good score. Yeah. What a, what a, what a movie. What a movie. I know. Here we are. And Look at us. I would say you're more of the dog person in our relationship I, here. I do love dogs um, very much. So, yeah, I, I don't know. I, it's not that the dog didn't movie. The dog was my favorite part of the movie. Yeah. I didn't know we were allowed to choose dogs. I mean, I should have known that. Um, I still would have chosen Mark Wahlberg. But, yes. Um, yeah. No. The dog. The dog was great. He good, was good dog. Good dog. Good happened. boy. Good boy. <laughs> <laughs> well, tell us what you think. Arthur the King hits theaters this coming weekend. Uh, you'll have a chance to listen to this whole spoiler-free review. We hope you've enjoyed your time and be on the lookout for our next one because we roll these out every single week. We appreciate you guys. We appreciate our EP, Ryan Spriggs. We appreciate the band Rhetoric for all of our original music. We will chat with you guys next time. Peace. Peace.